Okay, so we're gonna get started. Um, you can keep eating, um, hopefully, you know, as, you're, as you need to. Um, but I think that it's such an honor, and we are so privileged to have Lillian Blades and Dr. Karshik Sims Alvarado with us. So I want to make sure that you have time to talk to them, and there'll be a chance for everybody to ask questions at the end. So I'll start. <clears throat> oh, and I guess I'll introduce myself. My name is uh, Dr. Corey Claiborne. I am an associate professor of English at Morehouse College, and I am the director of the Movement, Memory, and Justice Project, which is a Mellon Foundation project that is one of the co-sponsors for uh, this talk and some other projects that are looking at social justice, criminal justice, really, and all kind of justice that surrounds black people um, in America. So I will start by introducing Karshik Sims Alvarado, who is, a, is an assistant professor of Africana Studies at Morehouse and the director of the Public History and Historic Preservation Por uh, program. She is the curator and exhibition uh, designer of multiple exhibits and other historical projects on the civil rights movement. And she has partnered with the Nobel Peace Prize Museum in Sweden, the King Center, Disney, Hulu, and Ancestry.com. She is the author of the Civil Rights Movement, sorry, Atlanta and the Civil Rights Movement, 1944 to 1968. And her second book, Georgia and the Power of the Vote was just released last week, and I just saw it floating around somewhere, so maybe you'll get to see a copy of it. And our guest, Lillian Blades, is a visual artist whose artwork ranges uh, from intimate paintings to large-scale public art installations. Um, Lillian's artwork has been exhibited in solo and group exhibitions throughout the United States, the, Bahama, the Bahamas where she was born, Trinidad, Italy, Germany, Dubai, and South Africa. Her public art installations can be seen in Hearts, Hartsville, uh, we're gonna just pray on it because I can't talk right now, Hartsville Jackson International Airport, the State Farm Arena, Georgia Power, Chase Bank, Hyatt Regency Atlanta, the Signia Hilton Atlanta at the Georgia World Congress Center, and many other public and private collections. Her latest exhibition, Reflections in Bloom, is currently at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens for Orchid Days 2024. Please help me in welcoming both Lillian Blades and Dr. Karshik Sims Alvarado. Okay, and so I'll just start with you, Karshik. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the vision for this art installation and how it came to be? Um, let's see. I'm so used to projecting all the way to the back of the class, <laughs> but um, I'll use the mic. So um, um, first of all, I mean, th thank you all for, for sponsoring the event uh, for the Mellon uh, movement, memory, and justice uh, uh, program sponsoring the event. Um, and I want to thank all of you all for being here. But the event, um, um, the installation came to be because um, as a historian, I work with photography. I always tell everyone I'm an artist first who became a historian. Um, I was in graduate school at Clark Atlanta University, and I had just completed undergrad in radio, TV, and film, and I was like, this is not what I really want to do with my life. And I was always um, wanting to be an artist, but didn't think that it was possible for me being a black woman. And so I actually wind up going into, um, major into, into radio, TV, and film, but that's not where my heart was. Um, but I graduated and then um, I wound up working at Morris Brown's um, art gallery as the first curator. But while I was there, I was like, I gotta get back in school. <laughs> and so I wanted to work in, um, I wanted to get a degree in museum studies, but there was no program at that time. So I actually wind up getting a master's degree in African American studies wanting to do museum studies, but I became a historian by default. So anytime I've done history, I've always found a way to connect it um, with art. And so when I created my first book, I, was, I didn't want to create a book just for my, my peers so 10 people can read and I can become tenured. <laughs> so um, I wanted to create something for the public and I was pushing this idea of making art 
and history accessible to all. So how do I put it within the public sphere? How do I democratize learning and the arts? So when I created my first book on Atlanta and the Civil Rights Movement, I thought about using photography because that's how I came to learn about history. In photographs, even if you look at these that's here, you all better have class, by the way. <laughs> I, photographs have a way of causing you to ask questions and the way you expand scholarship is by what, Taylor Battle? <laughs> by asking what? Questions. What do I always say? You expand research by doing what? Asking what? No, asking questions, right? <laughs> asking questions. So photography has a way of doing that. And so I thought about, like, how do I tell the story about the civil rights movement using a different medium, looking at photography? So I created the book, but the book was an exhibition. Then I took the exhibition, and I, 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 I took the book, and then made it to an exhibition. The exhibition was uh, four miles across the Atlanta Belt Line, but the exhibition was a book that you could read. Then a funder came to, came to uh, Morehouse, the Rich Foundation, and the Kenneth Chenault uh, family uh, grant. They decided to um, have me to continue to take that vision of having the exhibitions outdoors and to put it on the Morehouse campus. Well, it didn't happen that way. So um, there were some challenges in having it here. So then I was told, OK, go to Sale Hall and see what you can do there. See if you can bring some life to it. So I walked into the building, I saw the windows, and I smiled and I thought about my friend to my right, Lillian Blaze. So I was like, oh yeah, I know what I can do now. <laughs> and I'm such a fangirl of Lillian's work. Um, I've been following her for a couple of years. The first time I saw her work, I, I looked at it and I said, she's gonna be my friend, she just don't realize it yet. <laughs> and so I got her contact number from one of her patrons. Um, we met each other, she told me about her work. I began to learn about her style through her. And so when I saw this work, even though it was an opportunity for me to have the exhibition, I said, let me pass this blessing on to someone else. And so I thought about how we could collaborate and take the photographs now and then put it into an art piece, but now take this whole journey that I went on from coming to learn about history through, through art, placing in a book, then taking the book put it in, into an exhibition that was outdoors, now taking the exhibition and bringing it indoors, and no one that I know of have put together a book inside a permanent installation such as this. So I'm honored to be able to do this with one of my favorite, my favorite artists and, and besties. <laughs> so. Well, that's a great segue. So um, Lillian, maybe just well, two things. Describe yourself as an artist, and then talk a little bit about your process. Okay, well, I was, I was born in Nassau, Bahamas, and I knew at the age of 12 that I always wanted to be an artist. You know, so I, I've seen art, art, artists, they were mainly male artists, so I was a little nervous because I didn't feel like I would be as successful if, because I wasn't a male. Um, so I said, you know what, I'm going to do textiles. So I actually studied textiles first before I realized that I didn't want to be limited in what I could do as a textile artist. So I, when I was at SCAD, I studied painting. I, I switched from textiles to painting because I wanted to create more one-of-a-kind pieces. And I was always interested in... in texture in the painting. So I was always pushed in the limits of what I could do with the, the canvas. So I would cut up the canvases into small pieces and make them, um, I would wire them together like with screws and hinges and wire in different ways. So what you see here is actually 
the coming from way back from when I was quilting canvases together. Um, so from a painting into, well, I, I'm jumping ahead. Um, the, I, when I was at SCAD, I studied and I did a study abroad program in, in Italy. And, and so we went to Venice, Florence, Milan, Paris, studying Italian Renaissance. And it was a summer, summer course. And I saw a lot of churches with stained glass windows. I've been in uh, the Louvre and I mean, I've seen a lot of European work and I was really interested in work that came from black people, like, pe like, art, like art that was created by people of color. And, it, and in paintings, you weren't really seeing so many that, I mean, just recently, like in the, um, well, I'm, I'm kind of jumping around. Well, I went to, <laughs> I wanted more tactileness, so the work, be, the canvases became more like quilts because I wanted to pay homage to my mom, who was a seamstress. She died in childbirth with me. So the act of sewing something together with, um, it by different means, by put, it, it was making a stronger connection, I felt, and, and building on a visual tradition that was based on what she did as a seamstress. And then also other mothers and women who quilted or smocked. My, my mom also smocked baby dresses. She made bridal party dresses. She did a lot, she tiled, and so I wanted to celebrate all of that handicraft, working with your hands in that make-do quality, even though you don't, may not have the, all the right materials. My Grammy always said, make do with what you have. So I kind of took that as the main um, way of how I wanted to work. When I went to graduate school at Georgia State, the reason why I'm here in Atlanta now, after I left SCAD in Savannah, I came here for graduate school and I got my degree in painting. And Professor Walker, Larry Walker, he was on my thesis committee. He, he recently passed just about a, a month or two ago. And he was a very pivotal, um, uh, he, he, he challenged me in, in the way I thought about how I approach my art. He said that I didn't have to be so literal. I was painting mother and child images at the time. This was in 96, and I graduated in 2000. And my work has changed, pivot to, to more of a canvases that are joined together. Then it became more of a mosaic style. And then I got a commission in 2016 to create a hanging installation over a stairway for a company called McKinsey and Company. And it was gonna drop down about 27 feet. And no, not 27, like, a, but anyway, it was gonna take, I would need a studio large enough to be able to create it. So that was the beginning of me working on these. And I'm just grateful for the opportunities to be able to work on so many projects that's come as a result of just doing one that led to another and another and meeting Kashik has let, gave me the opportunity as soon as she showed me the picture of Cell Hall I knew that I was I was like oh my god these are going it's going to be perfect in here with the sunlight coming through and when the sunlight come from the other side it would hit and become more like a, like a disco ball in a way when it gets dark <laughs> So I, I love that, and I wanted it to feel like us, like a quilt, like something that was handmade, lacy, uh, like, um, but also have the feeling of a stained glass window, which you would see in Notre Dame. Oh, wow. So, and this, this is so great. So I would like to hear from you both. Um, what, was the, what was it like working with each other, I guess? Can you just <laughs> describe maybe the... Good, the bad. It's, it's so much. Kashik is a, a wealth of information. She knows if you so could put much. Your, and the microphone more. She is so passionate about the the history, and I've learned so much just 
being she uh, she uh, my my effort in making a connection and things it was um, answered because she had all of the pieces she had all of the facts and information that I that I wanted to know more about so to be able to be able to create this piece specifically for this for the Atlanta student movement that had a had a major impact on the civil rights and human rights for us as a people. It, I mean, I was totally honored, and to be on this, have my art on this campus too. It was, I absolutely feel honored. So, yeah. and it was a pleasure working with her. <laughs> and Kashi. So you all should know. Anytime you go to Lillian's studio, she has the best soundtrack. <laughs> um, she has great music. She gets you moving, you're dancing. Um, her studio space is beautiful. You walk in, it's like walking into a rainbow because everything is, is um, it, it's, it, looks, it looks like the veil here. It goes from purples to blues to greens to yellows to orange and red and Everything, like even the way in which she organizes, um, you know, her materials before she even works, before before she begins to create a piece, and it's been really wonderful working with Lillian. I'm like I said, I'm a fan girl, so I, I love her work. And so imagine if someone says, "Okay, if you can work with one of your favorite artists." Who would you work with? And I'm like, Lily, Lily, Lily. Lily. <laughs> so it's like that kind of opportunity. But I've, I've learned so much um, from you, just the way in which you organize things before you get started, that I find myself even applying it to other things that I do, even with research that before you get prepared and you start moving, you have everything set up so you can just reach and go to it and you move things smoothly. As an, as an artist, I've learned so much from you about gradation. Um, I'm an oil painter, so we go from, one of the things that, that makes um, an, a subject matter look real is you have, to, can, you have to have darkness next to the lightest point to create the depth, right? So if you look at Lillian's work, she really is painting, but with materials. All her work, the way that you can know the bootleg version <laughs> of her work, if anybody tries to, to fake it, <laughs> is that you have to look at the way, her, the gradation of her work. That is her signature style. And when she showed me some of her earliest works when she was when she was young, she was already doing this. And what I love working with her, I mean, what I really enjoy is that, is, is that she stays true to who she is and her style is part of her DNA. She has found her voice. I can look at her work and I say, I know that's a Lillian Blaze. I see so much of her, her grandmother, um, her, her Grammy, her dad in it. Um, I see the threading. I, I, I see. I see everything, and, and and so it's just been a pleasure working with her. And in regards to collaborations, if anybody is looking at doing it, you have to be able to see the identity of both parties in it. And I think that that's what you see here is finding the, the balance. And while you have the mic, can you tell me a little bit about the stories that the photographs are telling? Yes, 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 yes. And I'm so glad to see Dr. George Ann Thomas. Did she come through here? Where did she? Oh, she's back there getting her food. She's not thinking about us right now. So, <laughs> I, oh, there she is. <laughs> and Charles Black, who's um, sitting on the second row, who's yeah. actually in the piece. Yes. Oh yes, he just had. Yeah, he's just been given a day in the city. Okay, so um, and yesterday was um, um, a celebration of the which anniversary of the Atlanta Student Movement demonstration? Which which year is it? Um, well, actually, it didn't relate to our anniversary as much to the um, 
the joining of the colleges, Clark and Atlanta University becoming one. And so that's that 35th you'll see on the marker. That's what that re relates to. Um, but uh, Councilman Bond, as you know, started the, uh, the Atlanta Student Movement Trail, where you have markers like you see on the quadrangle out there, all over the city, where we marched downtown when we were uh, messing with downtown business. Yes, so 64 years ago, March 15th, is when students across throughout the Atlanta University Center gathered to demonstrate in downtown Atlanta to integrate about 11, 11 or 12 uh, lunch counters. Um, um, and so they were pushing for the integration of public spaces. And so um, in the photographs, you will see student activists from 1957 to 1968 in, this, in these two panels. And so the photographs actually documents these students' activism. So we wanted to create what you don't realize, this is part of our master plan. So we actually want four panels going across. So we started with two, uh, representing 1957 and 1968. Panel one, will be the earlier years that really looks at scholar activists going from 1865 forward. And then the fourth one we would like to actually have from 1968 forward. So, um, so but we need money in order to do that. So you know I don't mind asking for money. But, uh, but that's what you see in the photographs, the student activists. Students from um, uh, two organizations, um, the um, Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, and then the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which you may be more familiar with, with SNCC, with Stokely Carmichael, um, uh, Ruby Doris Smith, um, James Former, and oh, and I always forget the other gentleman's name that's in the center, but John Lewis was actually one of the earlier um, um, chairmen, and um, Julian Bond was a journalist. So you're gonna see all of that within these photographs. Great, and so I have like two more questions and then I wanna open it up to everybody else for their questions. But, so how do you see students, faculty, alumni, and visitors responding to the artwork? Or what do you hope is their response to the artwork? For them, this is for both of you. Okay. <laughs> so what do you, how do you feel do you visitors artist? are gonna respond or what do you hope is their response to the artwork? Well, first and foremost, I still see it as a painting in the space, but I'm incorporating light and t like so that when you, I want to create a mood in the space. So when the, I want you to be drawn into it. The, the photographs were originally black and white, and we, we decided to have them colorized so that they would integrate into the rest of the quilt like patches of the of the veils, and Kashik actually did those. She she manipulated the, the colors, and then I responded to the to the photo to the colors in the photographs all around it. She the placement of all of the photos we collaborated on together, so that they would flow, the storyline would flow. So if you talk to Kashik about the lay, the way she could go from one photo to the other. So I want people when they come up and they see. We're going to have a legend so that it's, um, you'll be able to get information about each photo. So we've done that before as well with the, the piece at the Hyatt where, with civil rights leaders. So create a legend with the numbers of the photos and then a list. So I want people to be able to learn more about it in, without having it to be in a, in a book. But it's a way that they can just sit and look at it, appreciate it as artwork, but still it's, it's very informative and it's, it's documenting our history. So. Talk about the light, the hmm? light, the light. Oh yeah, well when the, uh, when it's, I, I took, taking the substrate of the canvas off, it's just opened up so much for me, being able to, to just see the, just see the, um, see the images in different ways, it changes so much. When the sun comes through when in the morning, it casts, the, all the colors cast 
on the floor of the, of, of the space. I love that. And then when it's on the other side, it, 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 ch it changes. It's not dark, dark right now, but when it was real, it's, it, it has, you see more of the white at the top. I wanted to blend it in with the white, um, with the walls and then have it come darker at the bottom. So you'll see more goals, white going into goals and then the pinks and the blues and the greens uh, around the photos, but I wanted them to integrate seamlessly into the quilt. For me, I, I want students to be inspired. That's what I want. I want, for, I, I want them to be inspired and I want them to learn. Um, I hope these photographs can move them to action. Um, I hope that it causes them to raise research questions and, and for them to see themselves in it. Lillian intentionally put reflective glass in it so you see the mirrors in it, so you can see yourself. Um, but like I said before, the way I came to learn history and became moved by it and inspired by it was actually looking at photographs. And I just started asking questions and I began to think about like, wow, who thought about taking a camera and documenting this moment in time because they thought that it was important, you know? And then to make it accessible to the public in different ways. So I hope it moves young people in that way. The photos are of them being their young photos just like as students. So, yeah, these, the, so you see young people in the photographs who look like those who attend school today. Um, so, uh, and, and, and I saw that my brother-in-law just walked in. Hi, Christian. <laughs> He's in the back. Uh, I have to give a shout out to him because he really helped me with, um, with colorizing the photographs. And I learned a new technique along the way. Um, some of these photographs, the way they, <laughs> we colored them happened accidentally, because I was just moving levels. And I said, oh, that's pretty. <laughs> I was like, if I can do it again, maybe I may figure this thing out. And I want to thank Taylor Battle, who's um, actually graduated from the public history program faster than anyone else, UNCF, Mellon Fellow, UNCF, um, K-12 through uh, awardee, and we're waiting on something else, and he hasn't even graduated yet. So, and, and I'm trying to take him to Sweden with me to the Nobel. And so, yeah, they, <laughs> you say taking you too? <laughs> oh yes, Africana Studies major, yes, yes, yes. And, and, and he's brought, um, future uh, public history minors uh, with him, Phoenix, and to his right. Yes, I'll, I'll see. I'll, we'll be getting you the declaration for him. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, but um, Taylor and, and another public history minor, um, Keon Rosado, very active on, on this campus here at, at Morehouse. If you know Keon, you're walking with him. He's like, hello, Mr. So-and-so. Hello, Mr. so -and -so. I see you over there. He, <laughs> am I right? <laughs> That's him, right? So, um, but Taylor and, and Keon volunteered their time on the weekend to actually assist us to install. You want to thank those oh, who also helped yeah. us install? Man, uh, this was definitely a labor of love. Each piece in the studio, like, each one of those are drilled and wired, and they're, the wires are all color coordinated to match the colors that are next to it. And I would not have been able to do all of that without the help of, of I gotta call this as um, Reginald Laurent. He's, he's my, my boyfriend. <laughs> he's, he's an artist as well. Yeah, and Sage May right behind him. She's, we spent many hours. And uh, I, I have another assistant here, Kelly. She, yes, she's helped me out as well. So yeah, we've had a lot of hours putting it together. And it's been fun. <laughs> okay, so uh, one last question. So I do 
to hope that this inspires, because I literally see poetry, I see an opera, <laughs> I see like all kind of um, art generated out of this art, so I'm really excited about it. But so to both of you, what are your future plans with this installation? <laughs> okay, with this installation, <laughs> um, we hope that it can travel. We want the other four panels. Um, give me the, the proper word. No, do you call it a diptych? But when it's four, it's quadruplet. Quad quadruplet. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. So um, we hope. Diptych, diptych, triptych, quadruplet. Yes. And so we ho we're hoping that this can can travel. Um, we would love for to take this to other HBCUs, um, PWIs, because they need to know that history too, right? So how can art also teach and inspire? And so that's what we hope, that's what I hope will happen. Um, we would love to have all eight, <laughs> but we'll start with, with four now. But I, I, I see for this, for this, well, these installations to be what, what this, what, what Hell with Drift Murals are for, um, for Clark Atlanta's art gallery is what this can be for Morehouse. And somebody may say, oh, this is a little arrogant saying that, but you know, it is what it is and the truth don't care what it, who it hurts, right? <laughs> but um, but I'm, I'm hoping it would inspire Morehouse to really consider having an art museum. It's the only school. Yes, 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 thank you, thank you, yes, yes. So we really hope it can help them to, to see the possibility of what it can be. Um, but, but we need that. We really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, this is not the, the typical art in the museum, but I'm glad to be able to stretch it so that it could fit and create a mood in this space, a space where Martin Luther King sat yeah. went on this floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's really an honor for me to be able to kind of bring my art into this space, and I feel really special to do that. Well, thank you so much, and I let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And I will mention this before I take questions. And so in this auditorium, uh, Mr. Black, Dr. Thomas, who you just saw, and some others, Marilyn Price Hoyt, Judge Brenda Hill Cole, they'll be here to be in conversation about what it was like to be one of these foot soldiers in the Atlanta student movement in this space in the day. <laughs> so hopefully you can come back when you can see the sun. So that will be on Tuesday, March 26th at 12. 30 p.m. So please join us again for that. And with that, um, Nathaniel, can you grab this microphone? And I will, if anybody has any questions, just you might have to come up to the front because it doesn't stretch far. Um, and we can take questions. Yeah, I should do this. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Hold on, wait. So I see Phoenix is coming up to the stage to ask the first question. Okay. And can you sh share with us? Um, give us your full name and then tell us about the wonderful AUC program that you are a part of. Yeah. I can lead. I know. <laughs> it's still tall. <laughs> I got it. Hi. My name is Phoenix Satterfield. I am a junior art major, curatorial studies minor from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, right now, since I'm a curatorial studies minor, I'm part of what's called the AUC Art Collective. And so now I have um, more opportunities for uh, artist talks, studio visits, and just in February, I took a trip to Chicago for the Art Insider Conference. So that was an opportunity offered for me by the collective. And they take trips like those every year. And over the summer, I didn't go on this trip, but they also went to Paris. So um, a lot of trips like that are offered by the collective. And all you need 
to become a member is to be an art history major, an art history minor, or curatorial, curatorial studies minor. So that's a little bit about of the collective I'm part of. Um, but my question specifically is for Lillian Blades. Uh, I've, see, I've seen other tapestries on your website, and a lot of them are on walls, and a lot of them or are on uh, just in the middle of the room in thin air. So my question is specifically, how is the impact of those two pieces shifted when they're placed directly on a window? Okay. Yeah, so um, I guess since 2016 when I did the, the hanging installation, that ex exposed a whole lot of new materials that I was able to expand what I do with like transparent acrylic mm -hmm. in different colors, um, interrogation mirrors, like security mirrors that you could see through. I was I started looking at materials in a in a new way, and so that um, got me off of the wall. I needed to have the light come through, either the sunlight or um, projected light. So I've. I've been lo just looking for opportunities to be able to, to create a painting in space. So basically I'm still painting with, with um, uh, like if I'm painting on a canvas, but I'm seeing it, uh, how the light would be able to, to paint the space, to create a mood, a feeling. So when uh, Kashyyyk, Gave, um, showed me the windows, it was, I, I instantly thought of how can I make m my version of a Notre Dame window, like stained glass, the feeling that I got when I saw the stained glass in the cathedrals. And so, and, I, and with the wall going in between, it was a, I wanted to soften that. So I had to use some, op I use opaque material. So there are some fabrics. I have some African fabrics in there. I have um, some painted, I painted some of the acrylics so that they have more of a modeled um, stained glass effect. I use mirrors of all different colors different um, opacities of color. So being able to, I had a lot of variety to, to play with when I laid it all out. So I'm working on a, on, I worked on four four by eight tables. So the table was white, so I could see what it would look like as if it was a painting, but when I took it off, it, the, it wasn't there, but the light would be able to come through. So that, it was a, did I answer the question? <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I would share with you a story that goes way back to maybe the I'm not sure of the date, Lillian, but it must be like it was 1996. Like 96, maybe. 1996. And I walked Olympics. into Hammond's house and I saw this painting, huge painting. I didn't have a huge house, but, and I absolutely, literally fell in love with it. And I, and I asked for the price and, and I thought, well, it's a stretch, but I have to have it. And, and, and I said, so I want to buy that painting. Um, and he said, you know, Actually, uh, the, young, the artist is very young and she lives very nearby and we just, we'd like to call her and tell her that there's someone here who's gonna buy her painting and she, she might wanna come over and meet you. And I said, well, that would be great. So I waited and in about 10 minutes she did arrive and now I'm madly in love with the painting and, and, and it's huge and it's, I can describe it, it's a quilt and, and it's all different beautiful canvases pulled together with wire and huge. Yeah. And in walks this beautiful little person. <laughs> and I expected not that. And I said, how, how in the world did you make this painting? And, and she, of course, as you know, she's so modest and with all her talent. 
And she said, oh, I just, and I said, I, I, I can't tell you how much I love it and I can't wait to have it in my home and I have no idea where I'm going to put it. But it has been in that house and then it moved to a condo in Peachtree Road. And then two years ago, we moved to another house and it's, it's also there too. So it has been just, I meditate in front of it. I'm, I'm going to bring this to a question. So the title of it is Zankofa. And I had never heard that word, although I've always been very drawn to West Africa for some reason. I don't know, and maybe you could enlighten me. But uh, I would have thought it'd be fun for you, and this, this goes way back to the beginning of this inspiration of this magnificent artist, to tell you why Zenkofa, why she named that painting, and then after that, many, many times I've heard that term used so beautifully. But I, I, I'm thrilled to be here tonight, and I can't tell you how much joy it gives me all the time to see how her career, when you see her in the airport and see her in this magnificent work here on the McKenzie Building, she's just such a, a, a treasure. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you, and I wanted to ask, maybe she would describe why she gave that painting, maybe the first that she ever sold in Atlanta, the name is Zenkofa. Do you mind okay. doing that? Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, Zenkofa means to go back and fetch it or to learn from your past. It's an Adinkra symbol from Ghana, and it's a bird, it's a bird with its head looking back at its tail. So that, to me, summed up my my goal with my work you know just to build a stronger foundation for myself um i i want to feel grounded i want to feel rooted in who i am and i wanted to represent me so my effort in moving from painting into all of the cutting up all of those at that point that's when i first started cutting up my canvases and and in making lots of tiny canvases out of wood, like small pieces, and then I would join them together. They were little oil paintings. And the, I mean, it was just the way that I painted was, it, it was like a, it was like a quilt. I knew it was gonna be arranged like a quilt. And, and I wanted it to pay homage to my mom, you know, so, and other mothers. So that was kind of the foundation of and I'm, you know, I'm also attracted to just color and texture and pattern, and that kind of brought all of it together, knowing that it was still rooted in a foundation of sewing and quilting, but still abstract expressionist in the way it's painted. Like, I'm, I've studied the paintings from um, much older um, African-American artists from like Spiral and you know artists like Frank Bowling or Richard Mayhew, who um, who basically did color field paintings, and so that's how I see these pieces too. They're they're color field paintings. So if you don't see the images and you see the way it's like I'm painting, but painting um, like a watercolor, but using a patchwork of materials, so, yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Nathaniel uh, Whitaker. Um, I'm a um, graduated senior Africana Studies major um, here at Morehouse, and um, I'm also an intern with the Morehouse Mellon Memory Movement Justice Project. And this is like a statement question um, you had mentioned like the cathedrals and um, uh, Empires, like the yes, Dome. yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. And I, I really, I really admire like that you mentioned that because like while I was looking at this, I was just thinking how like this really ties into um, like Black liberation theology, where um, we like. Yeah, Black Liberation Theology. So it's it's a it's a it's something that was coined by James Cone during like the 1970s, and um, technically taking the African the the Africana diaspora experience into the um, crucifixion story, Christianity, 
And um, what I really see with this, I really admire how, like, with me growing up in the church, like, the stained glass is something that's a staple, like, in black churches. And, you know, usually you see the Peters and, like, the Bible stories and this right here, like, this is kind of like our version of, like, the Bible story, like, the black Bible, in a way, with having the people who were involved in the movement as, you know, the disciples or, you know, the followers of, yeah. of um, Christ-like figures mm -hmm. from during that time. So I just yes. really admire that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you see it that way because that's, that's the goal. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, you know, when, when you're doing research as a historian, and those who do this work know exactly what I'm talking about. It comes, sometimes when you're looking for things, you're doing research, particularly those who have been enslaved. And you're trying to give voice to those individuals who never had anybody to speak on their behalf. There is a moment in the research where you realize, and Lillian, you know what, you know what I'm talking about, it's the same thing that happens with painting. It's not even you anymore. There's a spirit that consumes you and it takes over you and things just kind of flow. And it's in that moment when you're like by yourself, you're in this space and you realize that the work that you're creating is not even yours anymore. And it's like, for me, that's when I'm, I feel like I'm closest to God. And I realized in that moment, I am created, I'm wired, like the universe created me for this particular purpose. And I am my best self in that moment. And it takes me a little higher and it pushes me. And Lillian, you know this, that you challenge, you're challenging yourself like each time you do a piece. You are, you are growing, and with, with research, it's the exact same way. It's grueling, right? And, but you realize why you must complete it because it's not even for you anymore. And so for me, it's like when the creation of a piece like this or doing the research, it's like the ancestors show up. They show up and you become their vessel to speak, and you realize sometimes, you start doubting yourself. You're like, is it, is it me, is it talent, or is it these ancestors that'll show up in this room somewhere, right? And if you allow yourself to be vulnerable, you know, and to just let the spirit guide you, you will wind up producing something better than you had even imagined. So history for me is, you talk about religion, spirituality, black theology, this is ancestral veneration for me. And every time, it's a, right, it's an updated memory jar. You're honoring the ancestors, you're paying homage to them. It is Sankofa, it's reaching back, you know, and moving forward. Yeah, so don't get it wrong, this is a spiritual piece. And, and so that's, that's how I see it. So I'm, I'm glad that you see it in this way that these are our saints, our ancestors. You know, we're grateful for, for them so we could even be in this space and this is who we honor and, and give praise to. So Nate halfway took my question, but that's good. <laughs> so I can be very brief um, because when I'm looking at it, Again, you know, it's like you're moving from this very light, like yellow, it looks almost like sunset. Mm -hmm. You see and how it's changing, how now it's dark at the top because yep. the outside is, mm -hmm. in the, and the white, more, the white becomes more pronounced at the top. Mm -hmm. And then we move down into that blue, and which looks like water, mm -hmm. which I could imagine is almost like your um, home in the Bahamas, you know, with very blue water. Mm -hmm. yeah. But is that also like, a crossing over like into the Kalunga line, into yeah. the ancestral realm? Mm -hmm. And if so, so two-part question. 
So is that the case? And then are you really, while we going down into the water, and it reminds me of baptism too, the waters I was baptized in, not blue at all, brown, green, South Carolina, whatever. But Karshik, how did y'all, how did you decide which historical figures, ancestral figures would be sort of below that Kalunga line? And which ones would you keep up higher? And it's not, I'm not saying it's a hierarchical, I'm saying in some ways it could be just the opposite. What, how, how did you decide which figures would go into the deep blue, which ones would go into the more sunset? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a question for both of y'all. Okay, so this is where the collaboration becomes important. Um, and I, I feel like I'm a student of Lillian. So, you know, we could have decided, okay, well, let the photographs lead, you know, the creation of the piece, you know. Could have gone that way. Could have said, no, what type of story are we trying to tell? But I was like, you know what? Let me, let me fall back. I wanna, really I wanted to see, what is Lily gonna do with these, right? Because we had already, she didn't tell me which photos to color, I just, just began to create them. And I was like, she gonna work her magic. Remember, we, we tried to like figure out, this would be blue, this would be red. <laughs> schools too. Yeah, we, oh, we thought about that. The colors of the schools. Red for Clark, the crimson for, for Morehouse, the purple for Morris Brown, green for, um, for ITC, the blue for Spellman, that we could put all of that in. But I, so I, I brought the, first we, we had the black and white photos and we arranged them. And then when we colorized them, we came back and the story began to change. So I was like, I'm just gonna fall back, I'm gonna see what she does. So she started moving them around, right? And then you start letting her do the Lillian, the Lillian Blaze magic. Yeah, I, it was a lot of playing around with the images, but I knew I didn't want it to jump around and have blue at the top and green. I wanted it to flow like if it was painted, so. I started painting some paintings pieces to match the colors in the photos so that it would blend all around it. And even though it's a patchwork, it would still, it would still, the colors would still flow from one to another, like if it's, like your eye would paint the negative spaces, but still be as transparent as it can be. I mean, if it, if it was, if it was uh, an opaque material, it went, and hair would be dark in the day. So I knew I had to keep it really light so that, and it, it's just opaque enough so that it doesn't, I mean, I, it, it doesn't darken the space. But it's, it still brings some color in, but I left the top of it a lot of um, transparent, um, like Claire's uh, frosty whites, opaque whites, and the mirrors mainly at the top. And I used the fabrics mainly in the, in over the wood area where it wouldn't matter if um, the sun the sun wouldn't get to it. So it, it does create some shadow, but I don't have a lot of it coming into into the bottom. I wanted the photos to dominate the bottom so that you can see them. So so we didn't go below the the wood uh, panel for the photos. And you know as. Lillian was laying out the pieces. We were going through the kind of like a dance on the table. And she would say, what about this piece? What about here? So if you look down at the bottom, there is a chronology. Like you see like, okay, these are the events that's gonna take place. I mean, that took place in, in March 1960 when the movement ignited. And then it moves up to, to start to focus on the, the young people, the individuals that were part of the, of the, the movement, and then yeah, the, yearbook the yearbook pictures, yeah. And then Lillian said, oh, I want them to look like they're talking to one another. So you'll see how they're looking at each other. It's a conversation that's going on. So we were like, okay, how do we have the students to look at each other? With eye direction, you know, when you look, Eye direction is important. It leads you from one piece to another, and so there. That the so if to bring you into the piece, I don't have anybody looking out 
to the outside of the piece, it all brings you in. And you all are doing exactly what we wanted you to do. This is where you're pointing to the piece. This is what we call immersive experience. Now you're interacting with the piece. Um, there's this uh, theory in, in the museum profession. Um, oh, it's called v VT, visual, visual theory. Oh, I always miss it up. I always get the acronym incorrect. But the, the what you're supposed to do, like in, in looking at um, a piece, um, there's this theory that was created by, by those within the museum field to teach people empathy and observation and critical thinking skills. So with doctors, they, were, they had to learn to look at art, to learn how to ask questions to observe, to study someone. Like when you go to the, to the doctor's office, they start reading you, right? They start looking at your body and, before, and they start asking you questions because they're trying to diagnose you but go through a process of elimination to see what it is that you have. So this was actually done with art. Uh, but art was used in order to teach doctors how to use this technique. They also began to use it with young people in the third grade, I think third grade and eighth grade. Third grade, by looking at art and looking up close at it and sitting with it, you start to ask questions. It's teaching you critical thinking skills. They said that when young people look at art and they are studying it in this way, their critical thinking skills double. When they do it in high school, they become a critical thinker for life. So how do we use this piece with classrooms? And I see some of you all were pointing at the piece. That's exactly what we want you to do. Like I imagine like young people coming in and they're saying, oh, look at the piece here, look at the piece there. And I imagine the guys asking women, you know, come to Sale Hall, because they do hang out in here, right? We've seen them. And, and watching the floor change, the, re the reflection change. And you've already seen it, right? You have this kaleidoscope effect on the floor. And this is just a way for students to come in and just sit and become centered before they go back to class. So it, there's so many different ways that you can use it and connect with it, but it is an immersive piece. I want to just say something. This is the first African-centered piece of art that actually marks a Morehouse building. That's true, because they put an afro on Jesus in the chapel. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is, but then they, they, they had to clean it up, right? But you're right. Yeah, Thank you for but saying I, that. But yeah, but I mean, just the, like, literally, you can see the African diaspora, African culture, the, the just everything, the Sankofa piece, it's, it's in it. There's no other building that's really marked off by a piece of African-centered art in the way that this is now. So I just thank y'all, thank y'all for that. So it changes what I was told and I'm being recorded. I was told this is the most historic, and I'm gonna look in the camera when I say this, the most boring <laughs> building on campus. So like, how do, we, how do we change that? How do we make it exciting? And I, I used to have a classroom um, um, on the first floor, and I would hear a student come in occasionally, play the piano, and the students come in here, they come in here you know, to sit to do the work. I see some people here, the couples that are here. There was a beauty pageant that was just here before we start the program. Um, so we see them coming in, but how, how do you use this space, you know, and I mean, this is, I love seeing students come in, coming in. This, this is their home. I, I love how they're interacting with it, but you know, we needed to bring some, some life into it. Yeah. Can't wait to see all of them. I know, exactly. Hello. Um, my name is Kelly. My artist name is Kelly Free Spirit, and I'm here um, in honor of Lillian Blades, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to know such a marvelous woman like her. Um, I met her a few years ago, assisting um, Tracy Morell in curating for the National Black Arts Festival where we invited Lillian Blades and 
um, a group of other really great artists. And I got to work really closely with Lillian. And before we really got into it, I was not the same woman afterwards. My spirit was lifted. My mind was so much clearer. And in so many ways, I realized in her studio, it was a healing space. And I see Lillian as a sacred woman. And there's a lot of beautiful spiritual aspects that happen as you're creating the work with your hands, with your mind, with your music, in community, and feeling that connection. But as a healer, I understand how much mindfulness is as you're taking your time with your work and you create space in your mind, right? Yoga, meditation, gardening, face masks, going to the spa. You know what I'm saying? Go to the spa. Uh, so I really want to ask Lillian, and well, I want to ask both of you ladies um, how your work is healing and opening up mental space for you so that you can create more uh, physical space and time to be patient as you create more work? Well, the whole feeling that I'm, that I'm going for with the work it, as I'm working on it is the same feeling I would want you to have experiencing it in this space. I, 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 in the gradation being as peaceful, as calm, it's, it flows like a watercolor, it's easy on the eye. That's, that's the, I want you to, but it's, it pulls you in still. I want you to be able to lose yourself in looking at the piece. And it doesn't have to be um, a very, loaded with information. It could be just looking at the colors. It could, that would put you in a space of meditation and just being mindful, you know, it, taking you away from the everyday. And that's the mode that I feel like I've been in when I've been, when I create. So, yeah, that's kind of what I, I feel the work offers. And for me, I'm always a teacher. So I'm, um, in all the work that I do. It doesn't matter what the medium is. I don't think I've ever created a piece dealing with landscape. <laughs> it's always a historical figure. Um, so, so for me, this is just another medium that has been used as a way to tell history. I can't get to my brushes the way that I would like to. Um, and so it's great to be able to work with an artist. Now you can say, okay, let's do this piece together because I don't know when I'm gonna have time to be able to pick up a brush to be able to do this, yeah. But, but all my work deals with history. Yes, Mr. Charles Black. <laughs> I was going to chapel every day and because I was a campus student we, that meant Sunday as well. And I sat from all those third seats up here. And I think these are the same seats. <laughs> I said it. And I came here in 1958. And I think we were sitting in these very same seats. And that podium appears to be the same podium. I want you to know that this is the same room with Martin Luther King sat in in chapel six days, well, five days because he was a uh, campus student. I mean, a city student. But more importantly, or equally importantly, the little building next door, which is Sail Hall Annex, is where our movement was organized. Uh, after uh, Monty King, who's there with his hand up in the air, and Julian Bond, the little cute guy. Where is he? I don't know where he's over here. He's over here? Yeah, yeah he's over here. Uh, and uh, the other guy, Met it in um, what was James Milton Drugstore, the site where Clark's student union building was in. Uh, Lonnie came on the campus, encountered me and some other students, and invited us to a meeting that night in that building, Sail on Annex. And that is where we began to organize our movement in February of 1960. So you're on special ground here. The quadrangle out there is where we assembled. We would march downtown uh, to pick up the city and the march numbers. Uh, young ladies from Scotland would come over, folks from Clark would come over. We marched to Clark's campus to pick up more students. 
March over we get uh, ITC and march around the uh, students and go downtown. So I want you to have some sense of place, you know, while you're listening to all of this and looking at these images up here. And in case you think I always look like this, old and rugged and, and, and grizzly, the guy standing in the middle up there with his hands like that with the hat on, that's what I used to look like when I was about 19. And the uh, picture up to the short, up to the left where you see the people sitting on the sofa, and one guy sitting up a little higher, that guy is me. So that's what I used to look like before I got like this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Welcome to us. That's a great ending because we can hear Mr. Black talk about some of these great stories that he has to accompany some of the pictures and he can explain them. So come back next week at 12.30 in this very space and the sacred space, Sail Hall Chapel. And you know, I'm really excited about us talking about these things because memory, which is one of the parts of our grant, right? We realize how powerful that is to have access to that memory, to have the students be able to sit and talk with you and hear about your stories because it really invigorates their own activism, right? And their own artistry. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Hopefully you'll take some time to talk to the artist a little bit more and I hope to see you next week. Thank you so much.